Um, so the next session is on economic and social vulnerabilities to climate change. Um, we have three really interesting uh, presentations. So because we're running behind on time, I would ask the speakers to try as hard as they can to stick to the 20 minutes for their presentation. That way we'll have about 15 minutes for question and answer and we don't cut into the coffee break. Um, so uh, first up, we have uh, Robin Lechenko, who is a professor and chair of geography at Rutgers University, and will tell us about economic vulnerability to climate change in coastal regions, which, given the events of the last month or so, should be uh, highly relevant and interesting. Okay, well, thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me, me to this, uh, this wonderful Congress. I'll the oh, apologies, the microphone. I'll try again. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me to the, this wonderful Congress. Um, I'm gonna, I think, in a way, bounce off a little bit of what we heard in the last, uh, in the last presentation. I, this, this is, this, my, my, my approach is a little bit different from what we've heard in many of the other talks in that it's much more of a small end study rather than sort of a large end study. And it really focuses in particular on what, uh, what we've been seeing in New Jersey and building a lot from kind of, an, in a way, an ethics of care, a way of doing research in terms of working with stakeholders, working with individuals, and trying to get their sense of what are critical vulnerabilities in their, in their sort of view, what are critical ways of building resiliency, and um, what the, and so this is work that I've been doing for about five years, so I, don't, I certainly don't have time to give you too much, go too much into it, but I'm gonna kind of zero in on something that this conference, in fact, is sort of focused around is this idea of resilience. And what, what, what's kind of emerged from that research in New Jersey over the past several years is that resilience itself is very problematic when you try to actually do resilience building on the ground. And so just in terms of resilience, obviously it's the title of the Congress, it's really become kind of the dominant way of thinking about climate change adaptation. It's, um, you know, all over, sort of all over in kind of various different kinds of projects. It's all over New York City where I work quite a bit. They're spending, you know, tens of millions of dollars in resiliency efforts. And what we were finding though, sort of in the kind of on the ground side of it is that it's, there's quite a few, quite a few problems with resilience, quite a few barriers when you try to implement resiliency, many different kinds of limitations to resiliency in terms of um, how it sort of plays out and how it, um, how it affects different groups. So just let me back up just a second with that in terms of just thinking about, so there's a huge literature on resiliency. It's sort of a whole, it's not just one field of research, it's sort of multiple fields coming from multiple different, um, multiple different sort of disciplines. So there's a hazard resiliency field, there's an ecological resiliency field, there's economic resiliency, there's sort of a whole critical analysis of resiliency. It's generally thought of as sort of an ability to bounce back. That's sort of a kind of common theme across these views of resiliency. There's also a lot of interest now in sort of this idea of bouncing forward so that you're not just rebuilding resiliency. You're not just essentially putting things back to where they were, but you're trying to sort of learn from the experience and make yourself sort of more resilient in the future, more able to sort of respond and recover and reduce future vulnerability. So that's sort of a, cons I would say, a consensus understanding of resiliency. Um, where, the, where the, I think, consensus falls apart, though, is sort of when we start to think about how to implement resiliency and what sort of, what are the implications of resiliency. So I'm, in this talk, I'm sort of focusing on three dimensions of the sort of the kind of problematic pieces of resiliency. One are barriers to, inter barriers to resiliency. The other two are limits and limitations to resiliency. So I'll just define those a little bit. And these are again like very much came out of the stakeholder interviews that we did over the course of this project. So, so sort of a bottom up approach to kind of these emerged. I didn't expect to be studying barriers to resilience when I initiated the research, but that was sort of what, what came out. So, Barriers are any kinds of factors that hinder efforts to build resiliency. So it's something, a legal, a legal objection to something happening, some kind of technical thing that can be overcome. So the idea of a barrier is that barriers can be overcome, that barriers are things that you can work through the politics, you can work through the legal problems, you can work through sort of the, you know, the problems in the policies and, and sort out how to get, get around those barriers. As long as you understand them, they need to be locally specified because they're so, 
so much kind of contingent on particular situations, which I'll, t I'll talk about more, more, more in terms of a few examples in a couple minutes. Um, but in terms of thinking about also with resiliency, it's very much along the lines of this idea that there's limits to adaptation. There's also limits to resiliency. So limits are factors that really limit the effectiveness of the resiliency effort in the long run. And so in New Jersey, we do a lot of beach replenishments, just a kind of a simple example, but beach replenishments. So every year, almost every year, the state of New Jersey, three quarters, three quarters of it's provided by the federal government, thank you to the rest of the country, replenishes the beaches to the tune of about $100 million a year. Beaches, you know, the beaches sort of get washed away over the winter for various, um, ver you know, in the, as a result of various storms and so forth, and we just, we put them back and sort of, we sort of, we sort of it, but there's a sense that we can't keep doing beach replenishment forever, and there's, you know, it's very clear with the rate of sea level rise that beach replenishment will not be something that is gonna be a resiliency option you know, out into the, into the infinite future. So limits to resilience are things that are sort of insurmountable. They're physical or ecological, technological barriers. There can also be culture, culturally things that we just, that aren't acceptable to us as a culture or, you know, in a particular social context. Those would also be sort of limits. Um, but then we also have to think about limitations to resilience. And these are sort of more kind of almost like the negative side effects, the problems when you implement resiliency. So inherent shortcomings, undesirable consequences, sort of ways that resiliency might, you know, you might make one place more resilient but unintentionally undermine, undermine adaptation in another place. Or you may reinforce, by building resiliency or reinforcing resiliency, you may actually reinforce sort of po power inequalities and other problems. So, you, so, res so the idea of building resilience without sort of thinking about you know, what are the underlying dynamics, the underlying root causes, as my colleague uh, Jesse has so um, eloquently spoken about with respect to vulnerability. If there's no attention to those issues, then resiliency can sort of have, you know, very problematic outcomes. So those are just sort of a kind of a little bit of an overview of the kinds of um, terms I'm coming from. Um, just this study in particular so looked at economic vulnerability in coastal New Jersey. This was a study that was, um, actually conceived well before Hurricane Sandy even even hit the coast, which hit now five years ago. And it, but it, and it sort of started with the idea that I want to understand economic vulnerability from the perspective of stakeholders. I'd been doing a lot of work on sort of more top-down, e understanding economic impacts uh, in different sectors, and I wanted to sort of shift over and say, well, what, what do the people on the ground really care about in terms of if we're going to spend the time to quantify economic impacts of climate change in coastal New Jersey, let's start out from the perspective of people on the ground. What, what do they care about? And then which of those little dimensions can we, those dimensions can we quantify in different ways? But, and so the study sort of evolved from that to, um, and we were hit by Hurricane Sandy, and so then it sort of became something, you know, a little bit different in terms of how can we build, you know, what are strategies for building resiliency in this, in this place? And, what are, you know, how is sort of, the, that the, the effect of Hurricane Sandy was, you know, a, you know, traumatic in many ways, but it was also sort of psychologically transformational in terms of how people, this sort of sense of this won't happen here, and now it's sort of like, it's happening here, and as we know, it's happening in Houston, it's happening in Florida, it's happening as we speak, unfortunately, in Puerto Rico. Um, so, you know, just the Hurricane Sandy, Sandy storm surge, um, Sea level rise, ver and this is, these were sort of, the predictions of sea level rise have only gotten more dire, actually. There's, we're talking, in a study that I'm working on in New York City, some of the numbers are like eight feet of sea level rise by 2100 as a kind of not really far out there um, estimate at this point. So, the, so sea level rise, hugely significant for an area that's um, basically at sea level and sort of tremendous, um, so just in terms of what's there, what are we talking about with coastal New Jersey? It's a highly developed, highly developed region. Most of coastal New Jersey, I'll just go back for a second, um, back to my, um, back to the map. So ocean, so this map is ocean, so it's Ocean County. Um, ocean County, New Jersey is about 600,000 people, just one of the four counties that we focused on. It's um, primarily a suburban area, so most people, it's sort of suburban commuting up to, New, up to New York, up to northern New Jersey for jobs, but it still has, you know, a very strong sort of sense of being kind of a coastal place, being a tourism site and so forth. So just um, what we're, so 
in terms of when we were asking people and thinking about assets at risk and what was at risk to climate change, people were really very much focused on sort of like the physical assets in the location. So, and so primarily people were talking about beach, risk to beaches, risk to sort of freshwater supplies and so forth, risk to all sorts of built assets. Um, we also sort of got a sense of sectors at risk. So, f so fishing is still a significant sector. E so, so it's a significant sector culturally. It has, a, you know, it's a small footprint economically, but for people there, it has, you know, very sort of very long tradition. So, uh, beach tourism, fishing, and so forth, the sectoral sectors at risk. Um, there's even agriculture still quite a bit in, in Ocean County. We also talked, you know, kind of got the perspective of different groups at risk, and this was sort of a lot of it was what you expected. So you expected to sort of hear that, you know, there was risks around emergency management with elderly residents, um, risks to low-income residents. But what Hurricane Sandy itself also brought out was really how significant the um, vulnerability is of middle-income residents. And so f folks in sort of, you know, mid kind of that middle-income spectrum who felt that they were doing pretty well, they had stable jobs, they, f they found that, that in many cases the damage has just been too expensive, they haven't been able to rebuild. And I think we're going to see that story all over um, Houston and all over Florida as the kind of evolution of you know how these these events are playing out. So just that just a, again like a little bit more kind of sense of sense of the place and so forth. So in terms of options for resilience, so what we were doing was really sort of you know doing very in depth interviews with with a lot of different stakeholders and talking with them about you know if you were sort of what you know what would be your kind of dominant approaches to or what would be your sort of best suggestions for how to enhance resiliency and. People, I think, one of the thing that, thing that was interesting about asking people about resiliency is what you primarily heard were people sort of coming up with the resiliency strategies that they know. So they're coming from what they, they already know. They, they know beach replenishment is something that we already do. Let's keep doing more of it. Let's do more shore armoring. Let's do more sort of green infrastructure types of stuff. There was, you know, so, so the dominant sort of suggestions were all around engineering measures. There were also sort of some land use suggestions around planning, open space, reforming insurance and so forth. And then sort of this idea of, well, maybe we need to sort of break away from beach tours and break away from so much, you know, dominant, so much sort of focus on those sectors and so forth. So there was sort of, you know, a nice spectrum of options, but very much kind of in a, you know, I would say in sort of a box of thinking of what people know, what people have already experienced. And so th that it wasn't a huge surprise. Um, but what was more surprising, I think, again, was how much people, as soon as they started talking to us about options to build resiliency, they immediately started talking about why we can't do this. What are the barriers? What are the problems? What are the reasons this isn't going to work? And one of the things that we realized is that, that Resiliency or, or trying to protect coastal regions is not something that just we just decided after we figured out that the climate was changing. It's really something that they've been thinking about for you know many, many, many decades. And I have a student now working on a dissertation looking back at the history of the development of, of coastal New Jersey and sort of situating it in sort of a much longer time frame of just you know v you know very significant awareness of how you know of how um, sort of vulnerable this place is. Um, so just these are just these photos. I just wanted to put these up as a couple. These are a couple of the resiliency strategies that were very much sort of followed out from Hurricane Sandy. So one of them, the um, the Sayreville, New Jersey, is just is sort of essentially this idea of buying out houses located in floodplains. So it was sort of get you know sort of get the houses out of harm's way and. What was interesting about this strategy, and I think it, it very much kind of illustrates when I'm thinking about a barrier or a limit to resilience, is that the only places in New Jersey that really went all in for buyouts were places that were away from the coast and that were sort of, you know, sort of middle to lower income with very little sort of what you'd call like shore amenity value. So the places that we expected just sort of from like, okay, the places that are most vulnerable along the coast, we'd expect to see some interest and no interest whatsoever. What people wanted to do was sell the property to someone who willing to then build, and then the, you see the lower picture, build a house that then they'll, they'll raise up on stilts. So instead of sort of, you know, Ending up sort of the resilience, instead of the resiliency strategy going and sort of you know being kind of implemented in the places that were most vulnerable, it was actually implemented in the places that were you know had the lowest amenity value and the least the fewest alternatives um, for what what might be done with the property. So this so then the Union Beach that photo is just Ill illustrative of what you know along co along you know sort of the coastal 
the, all the coastal counties, everyone who can afford it is raising their house. And it's about, you know, for a typical house, it costs about $50,000 for kind of a modest sized house to raise it. And that's money that people won't get from insurance. They won't have a place to reach it. And I, you know, I know we're well paid academics for most of us and 50,000 could easily pull right out of our checking account. But that isn't something for most people that's it kind of an insurmountable barrier just in itself. And so there's been a lot of kind of gentrification actually happening in coastal New Jersey as a result. Um, so let me just keep going. Um, so just in terms of some of the barriers that we heard about, um, various kinds of resilience barriers, um, instead of talking through the slide, I'm just going to jump up to, um, so a lot, of a lot of the barriers that we heard about were actually the fact of the development of the region. The existing development footprint, it's very intense development, extremely high value, billions of dollars in property already in place on the ground there and sort of the, the, so the ability to really be flexible and do much to sort of build resiliency is sort of, you know, already kind of, it's, it's already kind of set in stone a little bit in terms of what's the kind of inertia of the landscape. Another barrier that, you know, it was very sort of much present was just sort of the political barrier. So people felt like, you know, if, you know, the, the cycle of climate change, and we heard about this yesterday, the cycle of climate change is much longer than the political cycle. People are in place for a short time. As long as nothing happens, they're not going to, um, they're not going to be investing in, in climate change resiliency when they have a lot of other, you know, sort of much more pressing things. I put up the map of, um, these are the election results from the national election. And, you know what red versus blue, right? Um, so New Jersey is thought of as a very blue state, right? It's, it's sort of one of those, you know, those liberal northeastern blue states. But when you look at the map, New Jersey is actually, it has a, the, the highly populated corridors, the blue, but the more kind of quote unquote rural areas are more sparsely populated are, um, are red. Now mind you, those are by standards of central Illinois, they're ver those are very densely populated places. So probably a couple, you know, all together, you know, probably close to two million people living in the southern half of the map is sort of the, co is, co is all coastal New Jersey. And, but what, so what, you know, th I think this map illustrates a little bit at least is this idea of political, of the understanding kind of the political barriers. And when I've asked, so again, this is anecdotal, which we've heard already is, va is a valid way of getting evidence um, from, you know, sort of in individual conversations, but asking students who live in coastal New Jersey, in my climate change, uh, in my climate change course, actually, what's going on with people w in terms of voting around, you know, sort of not thinking in terms of climate change. It, you know, if we figure the red position is sort of a position that's not really um, buying into the climate change as a problem and so forth. And what people, what students told me was actually that a lot of these people felt like the the response to Sandy was totally inadequate. The federal response was totally inadequate. And now the only thing that they're really being sort of forced to do is to do is to rebuild under these much more arduous regulations. And so they so it was sort of a, actually a resistance to the efforts to build resiliency. Sort of you know obviously people vote for many many different reasons, but um, I felt like that was sort of you know an interesting piece of the story in terms of understanding even a place that was sort of that heavily affected by um, by a climate event having. Um, and you know, sort of how and, how and where that affects people politically. Um, so regulatory barriers, other kinds of barriers, lots and lots of regulatory barriers at the local, at, at the mostly at the state level that were problematic, that were reinforcing building patterns that were um, sort of not very conducive. Um, and then just in terms of limits and limitations, I obviously don't have time to go into a lot of detail with all these, but some of the so there's clear limitations for every single hard engineering structure that you're trying to do, you're trying to do that on Barrier Island. The Barrier Island is sort of by nature, you know, sort of a, a, a very variable, a very old beast and trying to sort of pin it down leads, leads to all kinds of problems. Beach nourishment I've already mentioned as having, you know, hugely, hugely problematic. Um, but another limitation that's I think starting to come out, you know, quite a bit now in, in some of the discussions post Harvey, post Irma and so forth are the discussions around Po the policies that are, we're putting in place that are actually reinforcing vulnerability. So the National Flood Insurance Program as sort of guaranteeing rebuilding, various kinds of, even, you know, people even commented like the guarantees of evacuation, the like people sort of 
know they'll be safe. They'll know they'll they know that they'll be okay. They know they'll be able to be to rebuild, and all of those sort of factors, you know, sort of, you know, essentially sort of you know reinforce the d building um, building you know in very you know sort of vulnerable, ex highly exposed places that you know on the face of it aren't particularly resilient. So I guess sort of rather than kind of ending on kind of like a all right, this isn't none of this is going to work. What I think was also um, started coming out in a lot of these interviews was that people were starting to kind of open the door to the idea of maybe we really actually need to do something differently. We need maybe we need to sort of think about um, you know sort of wh what are what are some alternatives that are out that aren't in the box that we've been thinking about. And so transformation is becoming you know, sort of very much sort of you know the thing people are talking about in adaptation. But I, I definitely saw. In, um, in New Jersey, you know, sm kind of small openings for transformation is, is how I would characterize it. So the city that maybe we need different ways of thinking about planning, we need to really rethink how we're doing policy. And I would argue we are, that we're going to see this happening as climate change is progressing, you know, because it, it obviously isn't just a New Jersey situation. It's, you know, every coastal area of the country, every flood prone area, worsening flooding, the, the kind of just, feasibility of continuing to do things the way we're doing with the National Flood Insurance Program with this sort of continually, you know, building and, you know, building, building bigger and stronger inside the floodplains and inside sort of areas subject to storm surge, where th that's, there, there's, that's only, there, that can only go so far, and I think there's, so the, the transformations will, will be um, sort of forced upon us in a way. Um, and so just sort of, just a kind of a wrap-up slide, just in terms of, Thinking about ap implications for adaptation of this kind of this kind of work and this kind of approach, um, I think rec the recognition that resiliency is, despite it sort of it has that great resonance in terms of its you know sort of language, it, it's quite problematic when you try to put it in place on the ground. That there's you know I think a lack of attention to real the barriers, the limits, the limitations to you know sort of to all of the, our efforts to, to adapt to climate change and and where and how those um, those efforts can play out. And, but I also think this idea of kind of bringing out those barriers, being more, you know, sort of open about what about what's you know what's really going on in a place like New Jersey, and how can you make this place resilient, I think um, has that potential for opening opening pathways for doing things differently. Thank you. Thank you Steph. All right, thank you, Robin. Um, next up, we have uh, Jesse Ribot from University of Illinois. He is a professor of geography and geographic information sciences, and also the director of the, of the Social Dimensions of Environmental Policy Program. Thanks, and good morning. Um, it's great to have been here for the last two days of this meeting, starting with John Holdren, who uh, gave us the um, horrifying image of what's coming in the long future. But I think we also have to pay attention to the things that are already happening now. Uh, a lot of issues of pain, suffering, dislocation, economic loss, hunger, and famine. And that's what I am going to uh, address in this talk. Now, the talk that I'm about to give is shall I say, fairly organic, in that the work that I'm going to talk about is very new. I don't have it entirely digested, but it touches on issues that came up this morning uh, that uh, Professor Preston mentioned on recognition uh, and ethics, but also Robin's talk that we just heard uh, on questions of what is missing in discussions of vulnerability and what are the missing uh, elements in terms of understanding how people experience crisis and what their priorities are. John Holdren said that uh, climate change in the United States is ranked 17th uh, 
in people's concerns. And that's because they have a lot of other issues to deal with, and they can't fork out $50,000 to reinforce their property in the face of a storm. Uh, they are living hand to mouth, many Americans. People that I work with are definitely living hand to mouth. So um, what I'm gonna talk about is the migration crisis uh, in the West African Sahel, and I'm calling it climate of anxiety because I'm trying to understand why today young West African farmers are so tensely angst, so troubled by their everyday experiences that they are migrating and taking the risk of death to cross the Sahara and try and cross the Mediterranean to Europe when, I will argue, things were not worse 30 years ago when I first worked in this area. I've been working in this area for 30 years in forest villages in eastern Senegal. They're not worse today, but the anxiety level of the youth is skyrocketing. It is just beyond uh, interpretation. People are troubled. Now this uh, is an image of some migrants crossing the Sahara in the form of a recent sculpture I did that I call Human Nature. I just made a bunch of rocks out of ceramic and uh, let them do their work. So the area I'm going to talk about is in Senegal, Tambacounda region. It's a dry land area and it is in West Africa, as you can see. Uh, this is just an image of a couple of, a group of farmers that are out cutting wood. Now it turns out that, uh, as I will argue, anyone living in the West African Sahel is resilient. The ecologists and foresters in the Sahel always argue when they see someone cutting a tree, stop the Sahel, oh my God, it's fragile. Anything that's fragile in the Sahel died a long time ago, I guarantee you. This is one of the harshest environments you can operate in, and these people have been eking a, a living out in this zone for a long time. So the problem, as I see it, or that is the problem experienced by Sahelian migrants who I've been interviewing and talking with, uh, these migrants are being, uh, they, they are leaving their areas and the problems they experience, unfortunately, are being hidden by climate and climate change narratives and interventions. Uh, analyses of the climate change experience uh, does, do not get to the root causes of their lived crises. So people are coming in talking about climate and climate change, and these Sahelian farmers are saying, what are you talking about? This is not our issue, and, and for many, many reasons. The climate change narrative is obscuring root causes. It results in ineffective policies. It makes populations pretty much uninterested in climate change, and that is, uh, the, the, it brings up the question of why then are these people suffering in this dry land area uh, if they are so resilient, and I will, um, illustrate with this, this with the case of migration. Now, before I get to that, as I said, this is fairly organic because it's very new material and I just decided I am going to present it. Uh, I am doing a study in southern Niger and in uh, Tambacounda region of Senegal with Papafai, a researcher I work with in Senegal. We're doing migra uh, interviews of migrant families and of migrant households, but also of aspiring migrants in the zone. And this brings up the question of why are they migrating, mainly because it is being depicted as a climate issue. If you look at the New York Times, if you look at Forbes magazine, uh, if you look at the media, you see climate refugee written all over the place. And the people we talk to don't know what that means. People in the Sahel don't consider themselves to be climate refugees. So what I want to do is quickly go through the, the way I define vulnerability, that is the risk of damage, and then talk about how climate analysts seem to frame it, how I frame it, and then come back to this case very quickly. So 
risk as most, uh, it's sort of an engineering formulation, probability times consequence. Vulnerability is a predisposition of some sort to damage, and a climate hazard is a stressor, weather-related stressor. So the way I look at it and the way many social scientists look at this, climate hazard and vulnerability can lead to damage. If there is no vulnerability, there is no damage. In fact, if there's no vulnerability, we probably won't even call the climate event a hazard. A drought where there are no people or where people are well protected is just an event. Where they're not protected, it's a crisis. Where they're vulnerable, it's a crisis. And so, crisis does not come from a climate event alone. It has to meet vulnerability, which is socially, politically, economically produced on the ground in the societies we look at. The goal of intervening uh, is to reduce damage. So what's the problem? The problem itself is damage. It's pain, suffering, economic loss, dislocation, uh, and famine that people are experiencing now. The solutions will be found based on understanding the causes of those damages. So for me, climate is not a problem. Climate events are not a problem until unless we project them to or we associate them with current damages. So the damage is what we need to look at and explain. Even if we're looking at future climate change and the kinds of damages people will experience in the face of that climate change. So we need to be looking at the full range of causes to identify a full range of solutions, right? Uh, typical analysis, hazard impact analysis, climate impact analysis, I will argue just doesn't do that. Uh, you need a more social analysis. So this is just a depiction of, a, of your typical climate impact analysis. You got the hazard, comes along, whack, hits society, and you get all these horrible things happening, right? And implicitly, they are the results of the climate event, a linear causal relation. Uh, it's implicit, right? Causes located in the hazard. Climate, that's where the cause is. But if you look at a vulnerability analysis, and rather than looking at the multiple consequences of a single event, you look at the multiple causes of a single outcome, that is the damage, dislocation, migration, you begin to find that it is not so simple, right? Uh, and in fact, let me just go right to the next slide to say, you begin to find that climate is one amongst many things people experience when they are suffering, when they are making a decision to migrate. So the case of immigration from Senegal illustrates this very nicely. Uh, being called climate refugees doesn't help. And the reason that this is not the case is if you look uh, at uh, the data, rains are recovering in this area. They're shifting, they're getting more variable, uh, they're recovering. They're, they, they have a long cycle of 20 year uh, ups and downs in the rainfall. The hungry season, that is the period before the harvest in which people cannot feed themselves or their families, is not getting longer. I've worked in this area for 30 years. A month, two months, hungry season. If if this was a climate-related crisis, you would think the hungry season might be deepening. We're not seeing that. Uh, so, are these people refugees? Is, uh, is this really the problem? Uh, the other way it was characterized, not as a refugee crisis, but the uh, European Union recently decided that they were gonna fix the problem at its source by putting a blockade up in the middle of the Mediterranean so that people couldn't get out of the legal uh, national waters of Libya. And they were gonna train the Libyan uh, Coast Guard to bring them back to Libya. So that was another idea of where the uh, cause is, but it, that's also not where it's located. Climate is a factor. It might be 17th on the list, um, but uh, I don't think it is the main issue. 
So the project that I'm now working on was inspired because on April the 19th, 2015, a boat sank in the Mediterranean with 729 young men on it. There were 29 survivors. 200 of these young men came from the forest villages I work in, in Tambacunda, in Senegal. And I wanted to understand why were they taking this risk when it was known, not only that death is highly probable on this journey, more people actually die in the Sahara Desert crossing than in the Mediterranean. Uh, it is known that the returns are incredibly difficult in terms of the kinds of work you have to do to send remittances home in the long run. Why are they leaving when, as I said, rainfalls are covering uh, and the climate uh, is not really at least the immediate issue for these people? And in fact, I would just, uh, for Chris Preston, I just decided to stick in that this is a misrecognition of people's own understanding of themselves. When they're told that this is a climate issue and they're like, what are you talking about? This is not acknowledgement of what they know about the causes of their crisis. And they know a lot about the causes of their crisis. Uh, I went back and I interviewed families of the deceased, but I also interviewed repatriated migrants. This is a young man digging a well. This well will be 50 meters deep when he's done. He's digging it with a pickaxe. This is typical. This is the kind of work people have. And he crawled out of that well to talk to us um, and basically told us his story. Why do you immigrate? We asked, what, was, what motivated you to leave in the middle of the night and save up a year's worth of your income to get out of here and take a bus uh, to Bamako, to work three months in Bamako, to take a bus from Bamako to Ouagadougou, work three months in Ouagadougou for some money, for $2 a day, work then to get to Nyame, from Nyame to Agadez, from Agadez across the desert to uh, the borders in Algeria where they were taken by Boko Haram, the Northern Tuareg rebels, and Al-Qaeda of the Sahel who have a shared camp. They work together, they're good friends. Uh, they were held ransom. Their parents were called. Their parents were told, you wanna see your kids alive again? Send $500. They did. They sold their cattle. They sold their horse carts. They sold land. They were destitute already. They then went to Libya, where two different factions of the army took them captive. One, supported by the United Nations, to repatriate them, kept them for six to nine months, and sold them as slave labor to construction firms in the cities during that time, and didn't pay them a penny, and hardly fed them with the money that was being given them to support them. The other faction also ransomed them to their families. And finally, they get to the Mediterranean and they go across the Mediterranean. Some of these boats don't make it, some of them do. They get to Europe and they are in debt peonage to people who they appealed to to send money to get them across on the boat. They spend a year working for nothing for those people in Paris, in Barcelona, uh, in various parts of Europe. Okay, now why? You look at the different industries there. Look at the cotton industry. After each season, they end up in debt because of the equipment that they had to advance cash for, because of the seeds and the fertilizers. Uh, uh, to, uh, and they have no way of fixing the terms of trade. In charcoal, they're f facing fixed prices. You ask them what the problem is, they'll tell you, they'll tell you permits, licenses, quotas, fixed prices, no representation, no rights, no recourse. They're destitute. They're left destitute while the merchants who are being protected by the Forest Service, who are being called entrepreneurs by USAID and the World Bank and other groups and supported, uh, they are making upwards of, you know, well, the really, really poor ones make $5,000 a year. The rich ones make over a million dollars a year uh, in this zone where most of the people in the rural areas are doing very poorly. They go to the hospitals for 
services that are paid for by the state, they have to pay market prices. They go for veterinarian services, which are free. They have to pay market prices. It's a market. You have a breakdown of the moral economy. So now during the hungry season when family networks used to support you, it's now the nuclear family for a variety of reasons. When there used to be government services, those have broken down in many ways and have been replaced by a kind of idea of a market where there really is no market. There really is no market. Uh, in a one USAID World Bank project, the quota was renamed a contract. The contract still specified the quantity and the place, who got to transport it to the city. In other words, it was still a captured market. Now it's called a contract, so it looks good. It's the market. That's nonsense. So these people know this, and so when you come and say climate refugee, they're like, excuse me? And so we have to be very careful because we want people to take this seriously. We want them to know what an extraordinary crisis we do have ahead with climate and climate variability and change. Um, so th they have many other problems that I, I can only touch on, but one is that the people who immigrate, they send back remittances. Their families are okay during the hungry season. So migrating looks good when you see no hope of a future where you are in farming. But the future becomes even worse because the young women will not marry the young men who haven't migrated. So young women, 13 years old, 14 years old, are being married off to the migrants who are already in Europe, men they've never met. The young men who are left behind can't marry. They're sitting there without partners. Now, it's not that they're without partners. There's a whole economy now of interrelations because, and you know, sexual relations, what have you, because young men, women who don't have their men around aren't very happy either. So there's a lot of social tension. Girls get pregnant, uh, you know, families uh, split apart, all kinds of things happen. And you end up with a situation where young men feel they cannot come of age. They say to you, I cannot sit here and watch my parents suffer. How can I sit in school while my mother is running back and forth trying to find food, right? It, it's, it's a disaster area. They feel hopeless, they see no future, and they say, Barça o la Barsac, which means Barcelona or death. In other words, I'm going to Europe. But it's two deaths that they're facing. One is the incredibly risky crossing of the Sahara and the Mediterranean, where they meet all of the insults I described. And the other is a social death at home. No more social security, no meaningful roles in life. They might as well leave. In some areas, I think this is probably related to the formation of Boko Haram. It is not about the drying of the Sahel. Uh, so, I've already shown you the, they emigrate. Uh, I've already told you the whole story. They, um, we're doing research on this now, 700 uh, surveys in Niger and, and uh, Senegal, and we'll let you know what's happening. But most households have somebody who's migrated or is aspiring to migrate, and many of the households have lost people. And that was what brought me initially was this, you know, really uh, serious loss in that one boat that sank. But when we interviewed these families that we were led to, we were asked, who lost a kid on that boat? They would tell us the story, and it would end on a different boat. Or it would end in the middle of the Sahara Desert, where they were dropped off by a taxi that they paid to take them across the, the Sahara, who let them off 50 kilometers into the Sahara at gunpoint and drove away. It, it's, it's an ugly scene. So, you know... If we sit around saying, oh my God, it's gonna be terrible in 20 years, and we can't deal with problems this deep that are here today, people aren't gonna see our cry as very credible. Um, lessons. There are multiple causes to explain migration. 
The weather is probably one of them. It's in there. Climate is not always the central issue. We need to focus on climate, but the focus is hiding our other causes. Local people are insulted by the invisibility of their struggles. Local people do not take climate seriously because they can't survive due to the most immediate problems that they face. Just like the $50,000 that someone can't pay to raise their house at the Jersey Shore, for these people, it's much smaller amounts of money they need, but it's still as big a problem in terms of their everyday livelihoods. Um, so announcing that they must adapt, it's like blaming the victim. It's like saying, you're like an organism. We, you know, stimulus, adapt. Well, uh, they need broader political, economic, and social support. They need integration into a broader economy, but not under conditions of permits, license, quotas given to merchants. Not under conditions where the world price is a lot higher than the price they receive for their cotton or whatever the product might be, okay? There's a lot going on. And we have to even bring into question how are world prices for these things being set and fixed? Um, so these people, experience anxiety and it is Barça o la Barsac. Uh, we need to conduct full causal analyses if we want to reduce the suffering that exists already but that will be exacerbated by climate events. So the migrants, they migrate. Some of them just get lost along the way and don't know which way to go. Some of them make it to the coast, you know, wait for a boat. Some of them sink along the way. But they really want to be home, hanging out with their families. They want a dignified life. And they, this is really the kind of qualitative stuff we can't measure. They don't want to be um, out in the desert. They're scared to death of it. But they go. Uh, and that implies quite a difficult situation. So we need a fuller explanation. I don't think we need the simple impact hazards analysis anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. <clears throat> uh, next up we have uh, Sandy Dalerba, Associate Professor of Agricultural and Consumer Economics at U of I. Sorry, it seems the drive doesn't treat that uh, USB key. Hold on. Okay. All right, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ben, for the introduction. Thank you very much, Madhu and Evan, for uh, bringing together so many people on campus and uh, from other universities who are interested in climate change issues. Uh, I'm a regional economist, and um, as you will see from my talk today, I am especially interested in understanding how different places relate to each other and how different sectors of the economy relate with each other. And the work I'm going to show you today is actually part of uh, USDA funded project, which is trying to understand whether those interregional linkages that I'm so interested in actually make sense when it comes to understanding the role of climate change on uh, US agriculture. So it's a uh, work that is uh, co-authored with one of my research assistants, Zhang Liang Chen here. So as we know uh, very well, and uh, as so many presentations over the last few days have reminded us, we know that the climate is changing and um, 
the variability of several uh, weather events is uh, very much increasing. And if you pay attention to the literature, which is un uh, trying to understand how climate change and uh, changes in its variability have any effect on US agriculture, the one point which I find is very interesting is that the literature is somewhat inconclusive. So I know there are several students in the room here. I very much invite you to work on this topic because as you can see from my short literature review here, some of the articles uh, in the field will conclude that uh, US agriculture is going to gain from climate change. And some other paper, which of course rely on somewhat different hypotheses, uh, eventually different time periods, conclude that the US agricultural sector is going to lose from it. So the field is not very, um, the answer is not clear, and therefore I think there is still quite some work to be done uh, on this topic. I believe that uh, working on a US case is very interesting for several reasons, uh, in part because the US is obviously a very large player when it comes to the world food, food market. And in addition to that, it's quite important to understand that changes to the agricultural sector will have consequences throughout the entire economy, such as uh, changes in the food manufacturing and processing sectors, chemical industry, you name it. So if you are interested in this kind of work, uh, I'd like to uh, make sure you understand that there are three different approaches which are traditionally used in order to understand that relationship between climate and agriculture in the US. Uh, we had yesterday a presentation by Dr. Ord on the first case, which is called the GROP simulation models. We also had yesterday a presentation using the second and third techniques, which are called crop production function and a Ricardian approach. The latter two were uh, by uh, Dr. Al Farmer. And the point that I'm trying to make, the contribution I'm trying to do, is that I believe that we need to pay attention to the role of uh, interstate trade when it comes to uh, measuring that impact of climate change on uh, US agriculture. So let me show you here a graph which is trying to capture for you uh, what is the methodological framework that I'm using. So it is called the Ricardian framework uh, in a sense that we are assuming farmers have a very high capacity to adapt to new uh, weather conditions. So on the x-axis, you have uh, changes in temperature is going up as it is expected by climate change. And on the y-axis, you're looking at profit per acre. What makes this particular approach somewhat different from a crop production function is that um, as temperatures will change, the farmers will adapt and decide to uh, actually switch uh, the type of activities that he's going to do, whether it is producing crop or it is suddenly rising cattle and so on. Many of the crops, uh, as we've seen also from some of the presentation yesterday, are very sensitive to different uh, temperature ranges. So you're looking at a convex uh, profit function associated to it. Basically, they don't like it too cold, they don't like it too hot. So what the farmers could do very much is to simply switch. A farmer that will not switch, for instance, you see uh, at point B here with increase of temperature, will eventually uh, be in a situation where the profit that he will get by not switching to a new activity will be less than what a, f uh, a farmer who is changing his activity and in C will, will be able to get. So there is a lot of discussion, of course, in the literature with respect to the capacity of, of adaptation of the farmers, but it seems to me that in the US it is clearly much greater than it is in other parts of the world and definitely more than uh, what we've seen in the case of Africa. So I use a lot of uh, regression work for my, uh, for my analysis. I want to show you very briefly what it's all about. It's really a, a model that is trying to understand how different factors influence other factors. In this particular case, I'm very interested in understanding how different set of soil conditions, such as permeability, um, and different human interventions, such as the use of fertilizers, the use of irrigation, as well as different forms of weather uh, characteristics, precipitation, temperature, extreme events, will have an effect on land value or agricultural pro productivity, agricultural profit, sorry. The one advantage of using uh, farmland value or, or agricultural profit as opposed to uh, the yield of a specific crop is that it allows you to work on the US as a whole. We obviously produce a very different type of crop here in Illinois than in other parts of the country. So you can really combine together all the activities that are being done on farmland and assume um, uh, that some adaptation is, is uh, going to be um, happening. So my interest is always about understand, understanding those coefficient estimates, the marginal effect of one particular input on, uh, uh, on uh, land value or agricultural profit. Uh, 
Several studies have been done along those way, uh, not enough in my opinion. I think that uh, there is still more to be done. So once again, I invite uh, students to, to, to work on those questions. So traditionally, this work uh, relies on three assumptions. I have no problem with the first two, but I completely disagree with the third one. So the first assumption is based on the idea that farmers are going to try their best to maximize their profit. Nothing wrong with that. Um, in the long run, you're looking at basically uh, um, that sum of profits is basically embedded into farmland value. The second uh, idea of that Ricardian approach is based on the fact that uh, farmers know better than anybody else what are the local characteristics of their land and what are, what are the local climate uh, decisions. So they will be the best at really adapting their production process to potential changes. Nothing wrong with that either. However, I totally disagree with ass assumption number three, which is so traditional in the field. And that one assumption is the one of absence of spillover effects. It's uh, very much of a stark contrast with what uh, people in um, atmospheric science, for instance, do, where they are interested in a uh, global model of circulation of water and, and of uh, different weather conditions. On the socioeconomic side, unfortunately, we don't seem to have fully understand the role of those interregional uh, uh, inter uh, spillovers and the fact that uh, what is being produced in one particular location is not necessarily dependent on only what's happening within that location. It seems to me that there is uh, uh, already several factors that have been highlighted by the literature which are um, leading towards including say, uh, the spatial dependence that I'm speaking about. Uh, some of the work by Spanish scholars uh, is focusing on something called ecological fallacy. It is basically the idea that the geographical extent of the weather patterns have nothing to do with the geographical extent of um, the counties or the states, the actual administrative boundaries we rely on on the socioeconomic side in order to uh, measure our data. So that's mismatch between physical processes and economic data and the way they are observed leads to some spatial dependence. Some work uh, which, uh, interestingly, uh, was applied to uh, some areas in India and in Africa is related to how farmers communicate with each other through personal network or professional networks. As a result, there is some uh, evidence that some innovative process discovered in one village is going to spread to other villages around. And in some previous work of mine with um, a, a colleague from Atmospheric Sciences, we try to tinker a little bit with issues related to the cycle of water and whether uh, evapotranspiration uh, experience somewhere leads to rainfall elsewhere and as a result make uh, agricultural yields uh, dependent in space. In addition to that, there is an enormous background in the field of economics related to um, uh, international trade with uh, contributors who, uh, for some of them, won even the Nobel Prize. But a lot of it is very much related to international trade and there has been very little interest on how the different theories of um, allocation of the factor of production or preference for uh, diversity that we see at the international level is relevant to the intranational level within the US. And this is what I want to do. So sorry a bit for, for the math here, but again, the, the idea is not very complicated. It's just about uh, showing you that uh, quite often in the literature, um, uh, the spillovers have not been accounted for, which basically means that um, any event in your location is going to affect the yield in your location or farmland value only in your location. I believe it is not necessarily true, and I'm going to show you, going to show you why. Two options that are uh, quite um, growing in the literature are focusing on questions of called um, global spillovers and local spillovers. The idea actually emerged from uh, the housing market where it's quite clear that, that the value of your house is very much of a function of the value of the housing market in your neighborhood. So there are some effects of dependence that can very easily be <laughs> adapted to questions of climate change here. Global and local spillovers have a slight difference between the two. In a local case, you're looking at how your direct neighbor affects you, and that's the end of the story. In a global case, the spillover effects go way beyond just your first set of neighborhood, and the extent of that dependence decreases uh, with distance. So there are very interesting techniques, but there are some issues with it. And you see here that I'm even criticizing a bit some of my former work here. Um, in a sense that quite often this literature has looked at dependence only based on geographical proximity. And it's not necessarily appropriate. There are some issues associated to it, such as the fact that with geographical proximity, you are assuming that the relationships are very much symmetric. Uh, 
uh, it's not necessarily uh, true when you're looking at trade. You don't necessarily export as much as you are importing from a particular place. Uh, with, uh, um, with geographical proximity, there is no time change either. You are assuming that those regional dependencies are going to be constant in time, and with trade, it is not necessarily true. And they also lack a little bit of uh, uh, theoretical uh, um, background. So we try our best to do a little bit better. So what we do here is uh, a two-stage process. In the first stage, we rely on what is called a gravity model. A gravity model is a model that has been uh, used over the last uh, 40 years, which is trying to understand what are the factors that explain trade between different places. Um, we are going to use data that comes from the Bureau of Transportation and focus entirely on the US. Um, interestingly to me, there is already a, a handful of um, articles which are uh, looking at the relationship between uh, trade as a way of adapting to uh, climate change. But the one uh, flow that I see out of them is that they quite often are based on uh, CG modeling. We had an example of it uh, yesterday uh, in a presentation of Dr. Hurtle, which means that there are some very strong assumptions on the behaviors which are associated to it. I think that the econometric uh, modeling approach I'm using is somewhat more straightforward. And interestingly, too, they are very much focused on international trade. In other words, trying to understand the role of agriculture of the US in international food market. Of course, it's very interesting, in part because there are some uh, very important uh, trade agreements to be made at the international level. But if you dig a little bit deeper in the data, it turns out that the US is a very self-sufficient country. Um, Exports of agricultural goods represent only 13% of the US production. Import of agricultural goods represent only 11% of what we consume in the US. In other words, pretty much all the food that we consume in the US is made in the US. So the role of the dependence with respect to the rest of the world is not as high as all those papers focusing on international trade would like us to think. So in the first stage, I'm going to look at that relationship in terms of trade, what are the factors that explain interstate trade trade in the US. And secondly, I'm going to plug the result I get from, from that first stage into a model uh, called the Ricardian model that is looking at uh, the factors that explain profit in agriculture. So some additional information related to trade within the US. We have access to interstate trade for many different uh, types of uh, goods and commodities. We are going to focus only on crops, fruits, and vegetables because their sensitivity to climate is very different from the sensitivity to rising cattle, for instance, or uh, rising poultry, for the reason that your crop, veggies, and, and, and fruits are raised outside, so therefore much more uh, sensitive to the weather, whereas your chicken can be indoor. Uh, if you look at some of the data, it seems that a fairly large amount of the production of any state in the US is devoted to be sold outside of the state itself. You see that the median value for export is more than 50%, and the import value is more than 50%. And as you would expect, the states in the US have different degrees of sensitivity to trade. Some uh, are very much self-dependent. You're looking at West Virginia or Wyoming, for instance. They don't really import or export more, much from the rest of the US, whereas Illinois and California are definitely big players. They do export a lot of their production, and they import a lot of their production. So that is the first stage, a gravity model trying to understand the factors that explain trade between the different states of the US. I follow very much the literature here by accounting for a set of variables which are accounting for issues related to um, uh, the level of accessibility of different places, elements which are specific to uh, your own locality as well as the locality you're exporting to. Uh, because when you trade, it's obviously, uh, you, so straight flows will depend on uh, elements which are specific to the place of origin and specific to the place of destination. And in that sense, I'm accounting for um, uh, precipitation, temperature, uh, drought. I'm also doing something a bit different from what the literature currently does. Uh, many of my colleagues are simply accounting for the level of income of a place. It seems to me that you're not gonna eat more if you are richer. Instead, if you look at the data, most of the crop production goes to the food transformation industry. Um, an example is uh, the corn that we produce in Illinois. It is not directly edible. It has to be transformed uh, for uh, human consumption in the long run. Or a large part of it goes for uh, feeding cattle. So I'm accounting for uh, demand 
which is related to the presence of the food industry and the presence of the ethanol and biodiesel industry. I'm accounting also for differences in space related to the different climate regions that come from NOAA. And here is what I will tell you out of it. Um, let me interpret that for you. So what do what those results indicate to us is that um, uh, you are going to trade somewhat less with places which are further away uh, from you. That makes a lot of sense. You are going to also uh, export more if you have a very large capacity to produce. That also makes a lot of sense. And it turns out, as we would expect, that you are going to uh, export very much uh, based on the amount, uh, sorry, based on the presence of the food industry in the places you are uh, uh, exporting to. So nothing very new here. The one element that is very new and that I'm going to go back to later is on the role of a drought in uh, affecting the pattern of trades. We find that there is a negative role of a drought in your own location. It makes sense that suddenly you don't have as much production to export anymore. You're not going to export as much, right? But we find also a positive role of drought in the places you are exporting to. That also makes a lot of sense. If they themselves have experienced uh, 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 extreme heat at some point that led to a drought, they suddenly have much less uh, production. As a result, they need to import some of that production from their, partner, so from their trade partners. So you are going to export. You, you as a state are going to benefit from a bad event taking place in your trade partner. right? So I calibrate that uh, trade model to understand better the trade flows, and I'm going to include them here, that's my W matrix here, in a traditional Ricardian model, which, as I said earlier, so uh, traditionally was simply looking at how weather in your location will affect um, profit in your own location, on how, um, let's say, irrigation in your own location will affect uh, the profit in your own location. By including trade into the picture, I now explain very clearly how local elements and elements which are taking place in your trade partner are going to affect your own uh, local uh, agricultural profit. So we combine once again demand uh, from the food industry, from the bio uh, energy industries, again, so climate, uh, sorry, so weather variables as well as uh, uh, soil characteristics, different type of fixed effects are there, but I don't want to uh, uh, develop that idea too much. What I do here is comparing the results that we will get where we to not include trade and where we to include trade. Without trade, very clearly, you see a set of local elements, such as uh, the amount of precipitation in your location that will affect agricultural profit in your location. Nothing very new here. When I add, on the other hand, uh, elements related to trade, I show that um, the presence of the food industry in your trade partner is going to positively affect the profits that you make locally. When I try to dig a little bit deep, deeper into those uh, questions, I disaggregate the states which are uh, small players versus large players. In other words, the ones that export a lot versus the ones that uh, export uh, uh, very little. And it turns out that for those which are exporting little, uh, the presence of the biofuel industry in their trade partner is going to uh, increase uh, the profit in their own location, as well as the presence of the food industry in their trade partners. When it comes to the very large um, uh, exporters, it seems that the presence of the food industry in their trade partners uh, affects positively their uh, agricultural profits. And we once again see that local weather conditions, precipitation, drought, and all do have a, uh, an effect here. So in conclusion, the one element I'm trying to stress here is the following one. I think that we really need to pay attention to the role of interregional spillovers uh, in that particular literature. I do it for the US because, as I said earlier, so much of the production made in the US is for the US market, and so little of it is for the rest of the world. And what I'm trying to demonstrate is that we need to get a little bit away from those traditional measurements of uh, marginal effects. So far, most of the literature say that any event that is local is going to have an effect only on that particular locality. Considering the amount of trade that's taking place in the US, I argue the opposite. Instead, of course, your local elements still matter very much. I'm not denying that. But I'm saying that if you really want to understand the role of a particular event, such as a drought, you need to understand how a local drought affects you and how a drought taking place in your trade partner is going to also affect uh, your, uh, your profit here. Uh, 
What I want to do uh, based on this work is to, of course, do some estimation with respect to how future climate conditions are going to affect that productivity. But the one element that is going to differentiate my work from uh, the current literature is that future climate conditions are also going to affect the trade patterns. And you can, not def you can definitely not rely on the past trade uh, uh, because it hasn't been affected by uh, various climate conditions to the same extent as what we expect it to be uh, in the long run. And let me finish with that uh, one element here, which is trying to understand whether there are some other forms of interregional dependence we could think of. And the one that is also part of this project is related to irrigation. Uh, before coming to the University of Illinois in 2015, I happened to be a faculty for nine years at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And if you look a little bit at agriculture in the state of Arizona, it turns out that nearly 40% of the water used for uh, agriculture is actually uh, surface water. And where does that water come from? From the Colorado Rockies. You have here a sense of uh, how that river is. So the point I'm trying to argue for is, were you to be interested in understanding the role of uh, future climate conditions on agriculture in Arizona? You will, of course, pay attention to those measurements within the state, but you also better pay attention to how future climate conditions will affect the snowpack in the Colorado Rockies, because if there is a serious decrease in the snowpack there, you're not gonna get much uh, uh, irrigated water uh, from the Colorado River. Uh, and as a result, it is one more example on how effects taking place beyond the boundaries of your locality will have an effect on your own locality. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. Um, so if I could ask the speakers to come back up uh, for questions. So we're running a little bit behind, so we're gonna only have time for one question per speaker. Sandy, um, quick question. One is, um, you know, we know that in the year that there was a drought here in Illinois, uh, actually farmers made large profits, and partly because of crop insurance or because crop prices were high. So how do, you know, this Ricardian model, how would that account for such effects? And you might actually see these perverse effects. Uh, so that's a good point. So the effect you're referring to could be actually related to more uh, the price. So the quantity went down, price went up, that's true. Uh, but I think the result of that particular event is so that they obviously exported much less of the local production to the states of the U.S. So, uh, so I, I cannot really tell you right now what the effect will be. What my assumption will be is that um, other states could suddenly much uh, could not access anymore uh, uh, corn from uh, Illinois, so it could have benefited even Iowa or some other uh, corn producing state better because they suddenly will be compensating that lack of uh, access to Illinois corn by their own additional trade. Um, that's what I think must have happened, um, but it's something I could look a little bit more carefully into. Yeah. Uh, Jesse, uh, you started making a case that uh, sort of like climate-wise or physiologically-wise, not a lot had changed over the 20 or 30 years. Uh, and you, could you say a little more than what did change to start driving this migration process? You mentioned Boko Haram, and, and I think you mentioned s social breakdown, but I didn't catch what the fundamentals were from, of, of that. Yeah, Mark. Um, Boko Haram is not a cause. Uh, it's not clear what its effect of either. Uh, it's complicated, long history of struggles in a particular area. But what you have is in most regions of the world, in pre-industrial societies, you have what is called moral economy relations, recipro reciprocal relations with a hierarchy in which you allow the hierarchy to tax you in various ways, sharecropping, whatever it might be, and in bad times, they reciprocate. 
provide security, and it can be in broad networks, it can be in hierarchical relations, but those tend to break down. People invest in them. They put their time and labor into the household of the master or somebody else, expecting something to come back. But as they get into a more fragmented world where they're interacting in many different arenas and you've got the markets operating around them and they've got different kinds of opportunities, they tend to diffuse their investments too broadly and when it's time to call back, there's nothing out there. So uh, that's one breakdown that we see happening in the region. The other breakdown is, I think, the contract with the state. Um, you know, we say no taxation without representation. No representation without taxation was the, uh, no, ta no taxation without representation. But in fact, there's no representation without taxation either. So taxation is what makes people feel that the state owes them something, right? Must represent them and respond. Uh, here people are taxed in various ways, but it's barely by the government anymore. It's by a whole network of economic relations that ratchet them down to subsistence when things are good and ratchet them down to just below subsistence when they're bad. So the hungry season is constant, good or bad year. They're hungry for a few months. So it, it, it's an interesting thing to begin observing. Uh, we don't have good quantitative material on this yet. But we're just scratching the surface and beginning to look at the histories of these farm households. Uh, but they basically don't keep the income they make. The price of charcoal in Dakar might be at five or 10,000 CFA a sack, and they're paid 1,000, uh, and it only costs 1,000 to transport it. Somebody else is just skimming that off, and that relation of extraction uh, is what's giving them trouble. So there's a breakdown in the moral economy socially, but also the moral economy of government in terms of providing in hard times. I actually have uh, a question for Robin. Um, so you mentioned the role of you know, several policies that affect, um, you know, the, the way people build in, in flood-prone areas. Uh, so one thing that you didn't mention I'd like to get your take is the role of, like, flood insurance and also kind of the implicit insurance that's given by, uh, you know, after the fact aid from the federal government. You know, of course, we, ha you know, we have a legitimate uh, goal of helping people who are affected by uh, a hurricane or by a flood, but of course, this could also incentivize people. The expectation of getting that aid could incentivize people to build in areas where maybe we shouldn't build. So do you have a feeling that that affects wh where people choose to build in, in your case in New Jersey? It actually has a tremendous effect. I think the, the National Flood Insurance Program is sort of underlies basically all of the building in flood prone areas. So if that, and what the way that the, the kind of, there's lots of economists in the room, but kind of what my understanding is the fundamental issue is that the National Flood Insurance Program is not priced at sort of actuarial rates. It's, su it's significantly subsidized so that someone may be paying $600 a year for flood insurance when the actuarial rate would be like $18,000 a year. Like the, so when there was an effort a couple years ago to actually price out the National Flood Insurance Program at the actual kind of market rate, and it was, it was actually going to be implemented and then as, as you know as it got closer and closer it was like the bigger waters I can't remember all the the sort of additional names but it was just sort of um, you know voted down right in kind of the mo the kind of few months before it was actually going to go into place and so there's so much political you know there's there's just so much inertia and, and political inertia around keeping the flood insurance keeping the flood insurance program in place and then I think the idea that once we have a disaster, we're going, we have, you know, disaster sort of response and all that. And so that, I think, will stay in place, but I think it's that sort of structure of the flood insurance is just something we've decided as a society that we want to subsidize, and that's a decision that, you know, I think is going to have to be revisited whether we like it or not. Uh, well, thank you. Please join me in thanking the speakers. Thank
and we're going to have a short coffee break next.